Welcome to the European Social Network podcast series. Listen to the stories and the voices from frontline social services across Europe. How are social services managing the challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic? Or how are they supporting people to handle the cost of living crisis? How are social services attracting people into the profession or promoting innovation to ensure access to quality social services? These are just some snapshots of topics we are going to discuss in this podcast series. Welcome to the second episode of the European Social Network podcast. I am Alfonso Montero, Chief Executive Officer of the European Social Network. For those of you who don't know us, we are an ever-growing community, currently with 170 organizations with responsibility for social services in 34 countries. We provide an international platform for exchange, and we aim to empower professionals and those using social services. If you want to learn more about our work, feel free to check our website at esn-eu.org. The idea behind this podcast is to bring stories of social services to you. Our first episode last December focused on the cost of living crisis and the impact on the people with whom social services work on a daily basis. Today, we are going to discuss how the arrival of millions of Ukrainian refugees has impacted the work of social services in neighboring countries. We are aware of the amazing humanitarian response of local communities across Europe in the first months of the war. But a year after, we're looking at a longer term situation. And the question is, how are public social services supporting the social inclusion of Ukrainian refugees in their countries? To discuss this and other questions, we welcome today Gabriela Esmutza, who is General Director for Social Care and Child Protection at Bucharest's district in Romania, and uh, Tomasz Paktwa, who is Director of Welfare and Social Programs in Warsaw, Poland. Welcome to our ESM podcast series. A year has now passed uh, since the start of Russian aggression in Ukraine. Social services have been an essential part of the humanitarian response to support people arriving in your countries, Poland and Romania, which have been very much affected by the, the arrival of uh, millions of refugees. Uh, looking back, I would like to start by asking you, how has the response in your cities, uh, Bucharest and Warsaw, changed or evolved a year later from the humanitarian answer to a longer term approach? At the beginning of the refugee crisis, uh... Actually, in March, April, something like this, our uh, direction had uh, six support centers with a capacity of 500 places. In total, more than 2,500 people from Ukraine have received support in our refugee centers. In the beginning, we focused on providing short-term needs like accommodation, food, clothes, and of course, security. Since mid-summer, those who have remained in our centers have received support services to integrate in our community. We're facilitating the integration in private homes, access to jobs, integration of children in daycare centers, and of course, Romanian language um, um, courses. We had the support of many partners during the 2022, and we managed to integrate hundreds of families in the community. I've just asked uh, my colleagues in the um, in inspectorate for, for uh, emergency problems here in Bucharest, and it seems like more than 40,000 people from Ukraine came in uh, Bucharest. Also in the summer of 2022, we managed together with UNICEF Romania to open the first integrated Blue Dot Refugee Support Center with a capacity of 50 places. Here, over 100 families received 24-7 legal services, Romanian language courses, accommodation and food, employment assistance and healthcare. After December 2022, there were only 10 elderly people remaining in our district because we managed to settle them in um, houses in, uh, in Bucharest or they gone for um, relatives in other countries. 
uh, we have two social apartments, and in these two social apartments, now we have only 10 elderly people. Uh, in Warsaw, we, at the beginning, obviously, it was just the crisis management, so we had to deal with many, many refugees who are approaching our city. A maximum at the beginning of March was uh, 30,000 people a day. We had to serve, we had to help them, we had to inform them. So it was really a, I would say, crisis management. We had to find them the place for accommodation, organize catering, medical support, organize shelters, temporary shelters. Usually when it comes to the temporary shelters, we organize them near the schools, on the sport arenas, places like that. And obviously there were a lot of people who wanted to help, NGOs, uh, volunteers, and it was just a matter of organizing them, organizing the whole help, because uh, we had a pleasure to have a lot of people, NGOs and business who wanted to help. And part of our job was just to organize that system. So um, at that time, it was really like everybody in the city were involved in that process. Right now, after one year, we were trying and we successfully delivered proper management. So the institutions are involved Less volunteers, obviously, we started with, at the beginning, within the first three months, we had 14,000 people, volunteers, wanted to help, and we actually used them. So we figured out it was like nearly 1 million hours they provide us, 1 million hours services of our citizens to help to tackle the crisis. And we basically rely on our citizens. So the whole system was not only on the shoulders of us as a public, but mainly on the shoulders of our inhabitants. Thank you for this. I mean, uh, you've talked about a tremendous amount of work. I mean, you've talked here about uh, huge numbers, I mean, in terms of the people that you've been supporting. And of course, this has, I mean, I can only imagine the, the, the huge amount of staff and volunteers across your cities that have supported the different uh, services. Maybe, um, I mean, Thomas already gave us some examples of this. I was wondering whether you could go a little bit more into details and tell us about the extent of the impact that uh, the arrival of millions of uh, Ukrainian refugees had in your cities, the programs, uh, some examples of programs that you put in place, people who were involved, and also how did you manage to finance these programs? Maybe, uh, Gabriela, you can take us through this. We develop programs in partnership with eight large private entities that supported like UNICEF Romania, World Vision Romania, other foundation, also private enterprises. Based on these uh, programs, the logistical and material support was consistent and vital for the community. We had two daycare centers now for 150 children and family. One support program for refugee in the community with the SOS Romanian children uh, villages with a budget of 200,000 euros. One integrated service center for refugees like Blue Dot with UNICEF with an investment over 250,000 euros. The help of the partners, larger or smaller, was consistent. And thus, our um, organization was never able to provide the necessary services for the refugees from Ukraine. But the entire activity required an exceptional effort and the level of organization, human and logistic resources. As Thomas said, the human resources was a problem because nobody was prepared for something like this. Let's be reasonable. And our colleagues, our human resources must provide also services, you, the, the usual services for our uh, people. And in addition to these day-to-day problems, we must uh, deal with the problem of the refugees. In total, like a cost, Last year for us was uh, uh, over 1.2 million euros. Then almost half of them coming from the donation and input from partners, considering that in the first weeks we supported border areas with donation, both for Ukraine and uh, for the Republic of Moldova. 
I was wondering, uh, listening to the situation in Bucharest, uh, Thomas, how you see resonance with the situation in Warsaw? Uh, first of all, I have to tell you that most of our citizens support the actions we provide, even though we equalize uh, Ukrainians with the rights of our citizens. In other words, the Ukrainians has the full access to the healthcare, social security system, labor market. Even though uh, some of the first of our citizens was that the, uh, they might have a limited access to that service, but even though 85% of our citizens support us, what is more, 75% of whole uh, were Soviet, were involved in the help somehow. Sometimes they distribute money. Sometimes the, they uh, were participating within the gathering things, food, to the uh, refugee centers, small refugee centers we organize. So I would say there was a huge movement. The main purpose on our shoulder was just to manage that, manage that resources. But obviously that requires some money. Uh, the beginning was difficult to get the money, but we received a lot of promises. Basing on those promises, we actually spent our own money and then to some extent we received some uh, reimbursements. Anyway, when we calculated the whole year, it cost us approximately 100 million euros. That was the, the total price we spent on hosting our inhabitants. But what is the most important is that most of that money, I mean more than 50%, goes directly to our citizen for hosting uh, our refugees. Because if you take the, the numbers, more than 1 million refugees actually approach our city. Not all obviously stayed. Maximum at, at one moment was uh, 300,000. But even though if we calculate those numbers, we as a public sector, we wouldn't be able to host all of them and help them to find a job. That's why we base a lot on the, on the shoulders of our citizens. And I have to underline that because Apart from that, obviously, we organize shelters. We've got still 2,000 uh, refugees in the shelters. But parallelly, 75,000 uh, refugees get a job only in the city of Warsaw. I mean, I can't see how this must have been a tremendous amount of work. And uh, of course, uh, it cannot have been easy. I mean, uh, Gabriela, can you share with us some of the main challenges that you faced along the way to make all of this support happen? Yes, of course. Um, I just listened to Thomas and he said uh, about the integration in, in community. Maybe for uh, the people who came in uh, in uh, Warsaw was a little bit easier for them to adapt, I think, because of the language. Maybe. I don't know. But uh, for me, as a Romanian, the Ukrainian language seems a little bit like uh, like Polish. Maybe they understand each other easily than with us. For us, the main problem, the main challenge was the language barrier because we have a very few people that are there are speak um, their language. Uh, most of them, they are native uh, speakers of Russian language. We have only four employees who have their roots in the Republic of Moldova and they are able to communicate with them. Beside the, the uh, language barrier was uh, also the barrier of the expenses. We had no uh, funds in the budget to spend for something like this. Uh, the draft of budget for that year, not foreseen at the time of the preparation, some expenses for something like this. And there are difficulties in settling the expenses made at the local level by institution at the central level. Their slowness in managing and facilitating access to external funds for the refugees is one of the reasons why even today we have not been settled all the expenses to be reimbursed. Another uh, challenge was the, um, the special situation of, the, of some of them, like refugees with serious neuropsychic or mental medical problems. Uh, the intervention for them being very difficult due to the differences of typology from a medical point of view combined with a larger barrier. Quite a number of challenges there. I mean, I wonder whether these challenges uh, resonate also with uh, the situation that uh, you've been going through in Warsaw, Thomas. 
Uh, yes, of course, more, more or less the same as I, I have to agree with Gabriela that the barrier of language in Poland wasn't that high as in Romania. Our languages are, uh, are similar and it required four months intensive course for uh, um, Ukrainians to be able to get a higher quality job. Obviously, when it comes to the low quality job, you don't require almost any trainings in the field. Apart from that, the same exactly program uh, as in, in, in Romania, 10 euros per day per person who actually hosting. This is what I said, half of the budget which we spent, uh, 50 million euros, was distributed to the people who actually hosting our refugees. So big support from that side. And also, I haven't mentioned that we also have UNICEF who support us, International Organization for Migration, International Rescue Committee, and we still cooperate with those organizations when it comes to the shelters. For instance, if we don't have money for integration programs, these organizations actually cover the services. They don't distribute money directly to the city, but we manage them. We organize steering committees. We deciding what kind of service should be covered, and they actually cover that. So big support from the international organization. Obviously, there was a massive impact for uh, your organization, but I wonder for yourselves as directors with such a large uh, responsibility, uh, Gabriela, how was uh, this uh, for you? How did you manage yourself as a director? I think it was a hard work, but uh, I think we didn't do well because we, we, myself, I tried to organize and to lead everybody with the calm, and acceptance for the the situation and for me as a person with it was not so difficult because i was like i said a little bit trained after the covid pandemics we had a little bit a little bit of experience to deal with them the main problem and the main impact in the organization was the human resources as i said because we have limited human resources we are a sixth part of Bucharest. We are a district. We have no resources like a whole city. And for us, it was very difficult to organize everything and uh, to provide quality services you know, with a small uh, number of people. The previous crisis related to COVID strong us, make our society and us more resilient. So when the next crisis came, we actually based on the same experience, uh, sometimes based on the same people, the same approach. So probably without COVID, it would be much more difficult to tackle that crisis. At the beginning, me personally, I was really involved. So it was hardly for me to sleep uh, because there were so many people, as I said, so many people were coming um, on the railway station. So we had to distribute them, relocate, organize everything. But then, obviously, after days, days, we reorganized everything. The whole city, the whole community was involved. And we also changed uh, the structure, me personally and the team. We moved on the sports arena where there were most of the uh, uh, refugees uh, so that we were closer to the problem. Apart from that, I have to tell you personally, it was really, I would say, a very good moment for us because we were feeling solidarity from many, many sides. We were united, integrated, helping people. And so, so from that point, I think that our service in future, basing on that experience, would be even better. So now we have moved on one year since uh, the beginning of the crisis. When you're looking at the situation now, I wonder, what would you say is the main focus of your support at this stage? The main priority is the integration in our community, to send the children to school, to, to provide uh, jobs for the others and for the elderly, to provide shelter services, uh, alternative services. The key element of our program is to integrate people and to make them to be more self-sufficient. From all these numbers, uh, thousands of refugees, we at the moment have 2,000 refugees in our shelters only, I would say. Uh, we've got 20,000 children in our schooling system, including from, from nursery through preschool and uh, elementary school to the, 
to the secondary school. And it, it works very well, I would say. Uh, so what we are doing right now, we are convincing children to be a part of our system because our capacity is at the moment higher than the, uh, the needs of our uh, um, refugees. Some of them still remain on the online trainings together with the Ukrainian schooling system, but uh, we're trying to convince them to send children to our school because it improves the integration process. Imagine that uh, you were addressing national and European policymakers and you could make two requests to address the long-term social inclusion needs of Ukrainian refugees. What could those be? My experience is that the um, cities, because most of the refugees go to cities, have the full capacity to welcome refugees. But what they require in times of crisis direct funds because we received at the beginning a lot of promises from the commission level uh, from the uh, you know uh, commission and european organizations but the money real money came from the unicef i would say they say we've got the money you are in need you can have it and you can implement so it was really fascinating because it was the first time somebody came and said okay this is the, these are the money procedures are would be somewhere else And this 6 million euros at the beginning was really crucial because we avoid a lot of problems in the future. So instead of having promise for, you know, 1 billion euros in future, it's better to have concrete money right in the moment of crisis. I was wondering, looking into the situation right now, if uh, you could address directly national and European policymakers and you could make two requests uh, to address the long-term social inclusion needs of Ukrainian refugees. What, uh, Gabriela, would you say uh, those needs uh, should be? First of all, a national program for Romanian language, because the, as I said many times in this podcast, the main issue for us is the language barrier for them. They are not uh, able to get jobs and the children, they are not able to go to schools because they don't manage at all with Romania. And the second is a, a program for training our personal, our social assistants, psychologists, doctors, and so on. We have arrived at the end of the second ESN podcast episode. So thank you, Gabriela and Tomas, for being here with us uh, today, for sharing your insights and your experience on how in Bucharest and Warsaw Social services have been supporting thousands of Ukrainian people arriving to your cities and how you opened your arms to welcome them through your incredible work. For our audience, thank you for listening. If you want to learn more about the work of social services to support Ukrainian people fleeing the war, follow the link in the podcast description. And remember to stay tuned for our next episode.